Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I am the VP of Sales here at Print Audit. Like I said, my name is James Hills, and I am joined on the call today uh, by my colleague. Uh, his name is Paul Georgie. He is our Customer Success Manager. Good morning, everyone. And uh, what we're going to do today is we are uh, we're going to do a bit of a tag team, um, and we're going to do a little demo of uh, how we help our premier members to um, uncover opportunity, get a larger share of their customers' wallets by using uh, the assessment tools and uh, various data collection tools that we have. So um, with that, we'll uh, we'll start. Hopefully, you've had a uh, had a chance to get a good laugh at the. Uh, <laughs> the vain attempts at jokes I put up there earlier. But um, the first thing I want to tell you up front is that this web webinar is not going to be about print audit. However, all of the things that we're showing you, both uh, the tools and the expertise, uh, they are included on an unlimited basis in our premier membership subscription program. Uh, so if you do like what you see and you want more information, let us know and uh, we'll show you how we are uh, working to save the office equipment office equipment industry. Uh, that is a, our mission and our goal. And we'd love to share the story with you. Now, as the title of this webinar suggests, what we're going to demonstrate with you is uh, how with the right tools and expertise, uh, data becomes actionable so that you can really surgically strike, uh, excuse me, target, strike, and conquer opportunities uh, in order to survive and, and, and indeed prosper. Uh, now, before we go into the meat of this, uh, well, I'm going to take a few moments to discuss data uh, because it, it really is uh, the underpinning of everything. Uh, now, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about your existing customer base, uh, you know, because that's, of course, your lowest hanging fruit for increasing your revenue. Now, how much do you really know about these guys right now? What data are you capturing? Now, you probably have, of course, transactional data uh, from them, which is coming from your accounting system. Uh, you're also going to have the communication data that you have, that sales information from your CRM system. And, of course, uh, in, in most cases, you're going to have a bunch of device data coming from uh, your DCA or uh, ICE, if you're using us, uh, or, you know, your, revo your remote device monitoring system. And, and that's great. Uh, but the problem is, that it's simply not enough. I, I mean, it's good. It, I mean, it's even critical to have, but it's not the kind of data you need to get the maximum share of your customer's wallet. What's missing, of course, is the user behavioral data. Now, because I, I really do believe, and, I th and, I, and I'd argue with anybody in this, uh, user data really is table stakes these days. Um, and if that's a gap in your knowledge about your customer, it's a gap that your competitor will exploit. I mean, you would exploit it, wouldn't you? Right? And if you want an example of, uh, uh, of uh, the, uh, the importance of data, um, think about Google 15 years ago. Do you think they knew that there was value in collecting data? I mean, they believed in it so much that they built a ton of really good tools like Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Slides, and all that sort of stuff so that you can run, you run your entire business on them, and they're giving it away. And I bet you can think of four or five other examples of companies that, <laughs> that, use, uh, that you use where your data is being collected, aggregated, and then used to target you with marketing to increase their share of your wallet. There's absolutely no difference in our industry, and I really can't stress this enough. If you're not collecting user data from as many of your existing customers as humanly possible, then somebody will come along with a really strong story and collect it from under your nose. And then, of course, who's in the driver's seat? Now, what we're going to show you is, once you have it, what can you do with that data immediately? But keep in mind, the true value of that data is, to the most part, unrealized. I mean, who knows what you're going to be able to use it for in the future as new technologies, tools, uh, realities of our industry, all those things become available, right? Now, I might not be able to sh tell you uh, what you can do with it in the future, but I can tell you uh, that if you're not collecting it now, you will be playing catch-up with, com uh, with competitors who are. Now, 
let's get down to business and I'm going to pass it over in a few moments here uh, to Paul to show you how our over 700 premium members worldwide are using this methodology to both win new business and grow their share of their existing customers wallet by combining and exploiting the things that they know about their customers. Now, as advertised, we said that this uh, the title of this webinar is the uh, uh, Target, strike, and conquer. Uh, but before we, uh, before I pass it over to Paul, what I'm just going to tell you is how did we, how did we go, uh, how did we get this information to begin with? Uh, so we are using information from our uh, data collection uh, agent. We call it ICE, which stands for Information Collection Engine, uh, and that feeds information into what we call Infinite Device Management. We also use our Print Audit 6 tool, uh, which is a client-based print management application installed. So you're installing a small client on each workstation in the environment. That, uh, that agent that will then track 100% of the printing taking place from that uh, workstation and collect 35 data points about it. Put that into a central database. That is the information that uh, we use to understand what's going on from a workflow and a user behavior point of view. So with that in mind, I'm going to pass this over to Paul and we're going to tell you uh, sort of a story on how a, an opportunity uh, uh, can be exploited. Thanks, James, and thanks, everyone. Uh, bear with me here. I'm just going to exit that screen and we will get into <coughs> Um, some of the data that we're looking at. So um, this is part of the tool set that comes with uh, the Print Audit Premier program. Uh, right now what you're looking at is uh, an analysis of a sample dealer. Uh, this is a demonstration, of course. We're looking at one particular dealer uh, right now with a number of different things. Bear with me here as I just clear out a filter. Um, but as you can see here, we've got quite a bit of metrics when it comes to just looking at the oversight of an actual dealership. Um, first off, you'll notice right in the middle, there is a little, uh, what looks like a gas gauge. It is called an MPS rating. What we've done is we've gathered all the information about the models and manufacturers of devices that we currently monitor. And what we've done is we've come up with a rating system. Think of it much like a restaurant rating system, one being very poor, five being very good. Five is obviously the restaurant you want to eat at. This is the same type of concept with this rating system on devices. One means a device does not report very well. Five means a device that does report very well. For further explanation on that, uh, we'll send a follow-up email. We have, uh, we've got a website that you can take a look at called mpscertified.com. And just as a uh, just as a, a, um, a further clarification on that, uh, so the uh, what we're looking at when we're saying doesn't perform very well, what we're looking at it is uh, its suitability to be part of an MPS program, based on its ability to um, uh, uh, relate and track uh, depletion of toner. Obviously, if 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 it does if it's not very good at uh, reporting the toner depletion, it's not going to be a good uh, um, machine uh, in order to su uh, support a just-in-time uh, toner fulfillment program. Sorry, Paul, carry on. So bear with me here. I'm going to pull up some annotations so you guys can follow along on the screen. Um, as you can see, uh, this dealership right now is averaging at about 3.49, which is what we typically see most office equipment dealers do. Uh, they have devices that rate you know, a 1 or a rate of 5. Uh, but as we progress through this technology, especially with remote monitoring systems, uh, we're seeing more and more manufacturers develop towards providing more and more granular information. So this, that number should go up. We have 368 customers. Uh, we're tracking 2,300 uh, devices. Uh, when we look at the uh, amount of revenue that we're collecting through this system, uh, we're looking at a, you know, well over uh, $160,000 every single month in click charges. Now, we've, we've sort of uh, aggregated that down to uh, an average of about a penny and a half black and white and six cents color for this uh, demonstration. But what you'll notice is right in the center of the page, there is this unmanaged revenue. 
Now, the unmanaged revenue, we break it down into color and mono, just like the uh, just like the revenue that you're collecting here at the top. But with that unmanaged revenue, uh, what you're looking at here is in my existing MIF, I have twenty six thousand mono pages that are going, or twenty six thousand dollars worth of mono pages and an additional 16,000 worth of color pages that are going to devices that I do not have under contract. For any dealership, any office equipment dealer in the marketplace today, this is a golden opportunity. You already have the relationship with the customer. They have these devices in there, and this is a way to get this revenue and, and look at it. So where do we go from here? Now we know that there are some uh, devices out there that we need to look at. We need to look at uh, figuring out how do we target this information? How do we target this, the, this uh, revenue? So let me scroll down to the bottom of this page. First thing you'll see here is that there are two pie charts. The one on the left hand side shows how many devices. This customer here, uh, this dealership here, we've got 56% of the devices uh, managing um, that we're tracking. So out of the 2,300, we're tracking about 1,300 devices uh, under a managed contract. But there's a thousand devices here that are not. When I look at the pie chart over on the right hand side, you'll notice that this is broken out by volume. So on a monthly basis, we're collecting 75% of the meter, 25% are going to these 44% of the devices. So 25% of the volume which is about 1.9 million total pages, is going to 1,000 devices. But take a look down here at the very bottom. We break this out in a couple of different pie charts, but I'm going to or uh, bar charts, but I'm going to concentrate on the bar chart on the left hand, or on the right hand side. This is top 10 customers by unmanaged color. Now we've broken this out for a specific reason. Color devices tend to have a higher revenue. They have a higher click charge. They have a higher price point when you sell them. So we look at that unmanaged color to say, okay, if we can get in there with a better color rate, how do we do this? Look at the very top. We've got this customer, CZAG, and they're collecting 44,000 pages a month that are going to devices that I'm not managing. So let's drill into that. And as I drill into this, everything on this dashboard updates. So now I'm looking at the entire MIF, and there's something very, very wrong with this if I look at these two pie charts. I have 65% of the devices, but I'm only getting 56% of the volume. So that means that 35% of the devices, or 69 devices, is receiving 323,000 pages. So I'm going to drill into this, and I only want to concentrate on the false ones. Now, if I scroll up here, the first thing you'll notice is that everything has adapted to my filter. So I'm only looking at unmanaged devices. I'm only looking at this one particular customer. So it's one customer. I'm looking at 69 devices. And there's more revenue going to those than anything else. If I look down here, you'll notice that I've got it broken up by manufacturer. I see 2%, uh, or sorry, 3% or two devices are Toshiba, but most of them are Lexmark. When I look at the MPS rating, and we'll go back to that, you'll notice this is a great area to actually target again. So we focused in on, let's look at the unmanaged devices, let's look at the unmanaged color volumes, now let's target low rating devices on my MPS rating. So I'm going to look at these, 11, these eight devices that are rated a one. These are devices that report tone very poorly. So let's focus in on this. And you'll notice that it's all these Lexmark devices that they're doing a majority of it. Now, as I scroll down here, you'll see a tabular list. Here's CZAG. Here's the manufacturer. Here's the devices. I've got serial numbers. We're collecting the launch date of the device. We've got the MPS certification rating. I'm not managing them. I've got the page per minute speeds and fees of each of the devices. And then I've got the motto and color life count. The one thing that appears to me is that even with these same like models, there's a disconnect in the volumes. Why is this one C748 doing 11,000 mono and an additional uh, 1,100 color when no other of that same model is doing the same until I come up to this one? This particular device here 
even though it's the same one, it's doing 33,000 pages in mono and an additional 1,800 in color. There's not an even distribution of print volumes in this customer. So let's look at the actual distribution of volumes. And this is where we go into it. Hey, Mr. Customer, I noticed that you've got a lot of these print volumes here. We've got uh, all these devices that are rating poorly. Um, let's go and uh, talk about getting you uh, devices that we can help you manage. We can get you things like automatic toner fulfillment on them. We can manage them a little bit properly, maybe give you uh, a device that's a little larger or a little smaller. This typically works. As you can see, we've now got a very defined target list of devices that we can go after. This is a great one for us to say, hey, I've got all these models now to go after. I'm going to do a proposal to go after them to say, okay, based on the volumes, based on what we're looking at, this is going to be a challenge for you guys. We need to replace them. And that's just one way of doing it. This is just one example of how you can actually go in here and target a customer based on just the devices, not even looking at anything else at this point. Now, what we know about this, and I'm sure you guys have, have dealt with this before, is typically this will work out if there's a lot of devices that are not under contract. But what happens if these devices are under contract with a competitor? What do you do then? It's hard. The buyout on those is way too expensive. You need to look at uh, additional ways of trying to get this volume away. Because ultimately, even though you're not managing these devices, even though they're under contract and you may not be able to replace them, there's still an opportunity to increase your volume by an additional 65,000 pages a month. This is where we talk about workflow, and this is where we look at workflow in a way differently, where we're looking at the user side. Mr. Customer, did you know that 96% of the volume that is going to these devices is print? There are 64,000 pages that are going to these, these, just these eight devices. The, by looking at the volumes, we notice that there's a disconnect. You've got all the same late makes and models here, but the volumes between devices is very, very different. Do you know what your end users are printing? Do you know why certain devices are being utilized more than the other ones? Have you had a chance to look at your document workflow? These are questions that we actually teach our office equipment dealers to go after and use those targeting type of questions to get the opportunity into a user workflow. The idea behind this is to get the user management or do a user-based assessment. So what we do in that process is we look at this and, you know, for the Premier members, they immediately go into saying, okay, let's get the Print Audit 6 installed and let's start tracking who's doing what to what printer. What we do then is we get PA6 installed, we deploy it out, and we silently track all the users for a roughly about a 30-day period. Uh, we recommend 30 days simply because most companies will pay their invoices every 30 days, and it's an easy way to associate their financial spend on print to their actual habits. So I'm going to bring into view here, and bear with me as this readjusts in the screen size, I'm going to bring into view here a good sample of what this actually looks like. So this is uh, another example here, and I'll just show you through some stuff. Bear with me as I bring up my annotation. We've been tracking this environment for 31 days. We're tracking 456 users that are using 162 printers. During this time, they produced 70,000 pages black and white and a whopping 86,000 pages color. So at this point, we already know that this customer is upside down on their color. They're, they're producing more color than, uh, than what they should be. I'm going to show you some other metrics here that we see. Just as uh, just as to interject here, just now, uh, keep in mind what we're showing you here. Of course, it, I mean this is a particularly juicy one where there's some uh, where there's some egregious uh, areas that you can uh, attack. But the 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 process holds true for everyone, right? It's always going to be a question of okay, well, what's going on in this environment? Because you will come across uh, instances like this. Um, but there's going to be other ones where things are, uh, um, you know, being done in a in a very efficient manner. So 
but you won't know that until you start tracking. So it's uh, it's important to uh, understand that uh, your approach and uh, how you're going to, uh, what strategy you're going to recommend is always going to be, it's going to be unique to each, uh, each environment. So uh, it's not one size fits all. There's literally hundreds of different ways to go through this data to try and uncover where uh, you can, uh, um, you know, what you, what you can exploit and help the customer. So just wanted to preface that. So now we've got this data and we're looking at some initial metrics and as you can see there's quite a bit of printing. We already noticed that the color pages are way out of whack. No company should be printing this much. The one thing I, I will show you about this data is that this is all drillable. We can actually take a look at a bunch of information. But let me take your eye over to the two pie charts on the right hand side. I'm going to start at the bottom one. We look at jobs to job size. First thing about the workflow that we notice, 87% of the time an end user is clicking print. It's a job between one and three pages. When I compare that same data to the actual volume output, which is the pie chart above it, you'll notice that 46% of the volume is consisted of jobs between one and three pages. So what does that tell you? That tells you that those high frequency jobs do not take up most of the metering. The thing that we want to look at is this large job chunk here. 50 plus pages represents 24% of the meter output. When I look at this at the bottom, it's only 1% of the time. So 1% of the time an end user clicking print represents 24% of the volume output. So let's find out what's going on there. I'm going to click into this pie chart and we're going to take a look at this. And the first thing you'll notice is that all the tiles update. And they all update to the most uh, recent information. So out of those 400 users, we're only looking at 67 users uh, that are printing jobs of large size. They're using 36 different printers. But the average job size is astronomical at 210 pages. If you notice down here with this pie chart on the left-hand side, 11% of the devices that are used are USB. So let's dig into that. So here's our first inefficient problem. And this is always the first recommendation that we do for any customer. Mr. Customer, you've got four users that printed five print jobs to four USB printers. And the average job size was 117 pages. This is a waste of resources. We understand there's going to be pushback if you rip out those USB printers, so let's talk about a way of managing it. Let's talk about a way of saving you this type of money. And this is the examples that we do. This is the type of stuff that Print Audit helps office equipment dealers with all day, every day. Now, I'm just going to clear out these filters. I'm going to show you a couple of neat little things about this that, uh, that we, I really, really like about this. And I will tell you, every time we show this to a customer, the customer is blown away by the way we actually assemble the data for them. So you'll notice here this bar chart on the right hand side. This is the top 10 applications that are being used. The one that always pops out to me is Outlook. In this case here, I can show this customer just by focusing in on Outlook to say, listen, Mr. Customer, you got an issue here. You got 230 users that over the month, over the course of this assessment, printed off 2,600 emails. The problem with that is 1,600 pages of those emails were in full color. As you can see, we uncover some very, very big workflow issues. Why are they printing off emails in general? Why are they printing these off in color? Those are some of the things that you can start asking your customer about. So we've gathered all this information. We've targeted in on some devices. And we now are targeting in on some workflow. And we're looking at where else do we go with this. Uh, I'll just show you a couple other ones because this will be uh, pertinent for the next uh, upcoming part of this. Uh, we're looking at things like this. Percentage of web and email that's printed in color. So we take all the web browsers and we take all the um, email editors that are out there and we assemble this into one number. So we look at this and say, hey, listen, out of those applications, so Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, Firefox, Safari, uh, and Outlook, uh, we notice that 56% of the output is color. 
So there's our area of opportunity. We can actually reduce this uh, by targeting that part. We can also take a look at this here. Now this customer here was very good at duplexing. As you can see, they duplex 69% of their output. But if you see right here in the middle, there's this total pages number. And this is a this is a bit of an explanation on this number. What we do is we look at every single print job that was over 25 pages. And then we say, let's look at and focus in on the jobs over 25 pages that were printed single-sided. And then say, if we were to duplex them, how many pages could we have saved? And that's what you're looking at right here. So even though they were duplexing 69% of their volume, there's still an additional 5,300 pages that they could have saved by duplexing or enforcing some sort of duplex uh, policy around every print job over 25 pages. Because regardless, even though they're still doing a good job at it, there's still opportunities for improvement. Um, the other thing we also take a look at is uh, based on the users and the usage, what is the actual average usage? So here we've got uh, 155 pages in mono per user and an additional 190 pages per uh, user in color. You combine that out, that's your monthly usage per employee. And of course, down here in the middle, we've got our uh, cost per user. So based on the cost per page that we originally started with, which was a penny and a half black and white and six cents color, we recognize that this customer is spending about $14.50 per employee. $11 of that cost is in color. So there's another opportunity that we're striking at here. Hey, Mr. Customer, we can target, we can strike these out, and we can come up with a combination that's going to be a win-win for everybody. And just to clarify on that is uh, what we're talking about, of course, when we're when we're looking at this and making recommendations. What we're talking about is saying to them, "Okay, we we would recommend that you're going to put into place a uh, a rules-based print strategy." So that would be something like uh, being put in rules around what Paul was talking about to say, if you're printing a job that is uh, uh, from these applications, that we don't want you to print them in color because one little hyperlink uh, will turn that. Uh, that what you think is a black and white job into a color job or we can put uh, into place a rule saying that this particular job is too large for this locally connected device you really should be sending this down the hall to the multifunctional because uh, that's the most effic efficient use of that all right um, you could also um, be talking to them in uh, in terms of how do you put a uh, a secure release or follow me print solution in place uh, we we know that that has a, uh, a, a you know a real sobering effect on how they're printing right they people tend to print out stuff um, but with a secure release um, uh, solution in place um, they never actually go and uh, uh, print the hat out because they've got to go and release it from a station. So it gets rid of those unclean jobs uh, that tend to sit at the printers. Um, you guys are, uh, I, I'm looking at the names on the attendee list here, and I know we've got some extremely experienced people in here. So I know you know what we're talking about with that. Um, but the question then remains is, um, what is the custom, why would the customer say yes to this? So I'm going to ask Paul to um, uh, change the presenter role over to me so I can show you how we go about presenting this information to your customer. Uh, let me just... Paul, do you see my screen? I see your screen. Excellent. So um, uh, we call this uh, a MIF review, um, and uh, essentially what we've done is we've brought all the information over here. Now, in the interest of time here, because we don't want this uh, to be a long, long presentation, uh, we've done a little bit of the, uh, the, the, the data transfer over to this uh, already. So uh, in the environment we were just looking at, there's, uh, we've got uh, 160,000 total pages. All right? um, 70% or sorry 70,000 of those 160 are unmanaged so that's a stuff you're not being paid on right uh, we also saw that that environment's got a real uh, problem with color so we we can see that there we put in there that the uh, percentage of their color of their printing in color is about 55% now what we're going to do is we're going to put into some numbers. Now, obviously, these are kind of uh, um, you know these will change 
depending on your uh, costs and what's uh, what the competition's costs are in there and everything. But you know, it's all it's all flexible. But on an average, this is what kind of thing we see. So we're going with uh, on an MPS program, uh, a 1.5 cents a page for mono. Uh, this is, these are you guys coming in that you're uh, with the uh, uh, the smoking good deals, right? Um, and for color, we're going in at six cents. Now, if they're printing on um, the competitors' devices, those unmanaged that unmanaged stuff in there, we're saying okay. Well, averaging out of those USB printers and such, um, we're going at one point eight cents a page. So not a huge difference, and we're going in at nine cents a page for color. Uh, so, in other words, if they're printing on your devices, they're paying a blended rate of uh, 0.4 cents, or um, if they're printing anywhere else, they're paying 5.8 cents. So, in my experience, we see uh, in a lot of cases that that is there's a there's a much larger uh, gap between those two. Um, but we're trying to be modest here. So what we're going to do then is we're going to take a look and say, okay, well, what's going to be what's going to be the effect of uh, um, putting in place some of the rules that we were talking about? So the first rule that we've got here is migrated to volume savings. So in other words, saying if you're printing this particular large job to this device, and we put a rule in there uh, saying any job larger than I don't know, could be 10 pages, could be 5 pages, could be 25 pages, it's up to you. Let's just say we're going to say 25 pages or more, we don't want that device, uh, device seeing that size job. If we did that, um, of that unmanaged volume, what we're going to be able to uh, uh, save or m impact is around about 46% uh, of that unmanaged volume. So. With that one rule in place, you're able to sh look your customer in the eye because this is all their data, right? You're sh you, you've been transparent. You've shown them what Paul's just showed, uh, what showed you, and we're just putting the numbers in here, saying, "Look, that one rule is going to save you five hundred and seventy-eight dollars next month." Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is the. Uh, um, well, we do, we're not going to look at migrating the color volume sailing, savings um, because in this particular environment, what we're going to do is we're going to convert rather than uh, um, uh, migrate them. Right? So there's the there's the difference. You're usually doing one or the other. In this case, we're going to uh, we're going to convert. So we're going to focus on those applications that we were talking about that we showed you there that was doing that, uh, like the um, you know the webmail or sorry web printing and the email. Um, that is going to be around about a 17% impact. Take a look at that. It's almost $700 more that you can save them. And, and keep in mind, this is not coming out of your pocket. It's coming out of your competitor's pocket, right? It's a beautiful thing about rules when they're done right is your competitor pays for them. Um, duplex savings. Uh, Paul described that pretty well, right? So that impact is going to be around about 8%. Now, it's not a great big number, but everything is going to add up here. It's definitely a box of paper a month. Uh, now, the attrition savings is kind of an interesting one. Uh, that's where your, um, I, I, the, the analogy we use around here is like if you're driving down the road and you see, a, you see up ahead a cop, right? If you're speeding, what do you do? You slow down, right? It's, you don't speed past cops, right? If people know that you are monitoring what they're doing and what they're printing, they stop doing it. So, um, and, and the attrition uh, savings, it measures that. It also measures the effect of perhaps putting in that uh, secure release and follow me uh, solution. So um, that, can, that can be a, a fluid number, um, but let's put in there, for conservative sake, uh, a 5% attrition rate. Now you'll notice that we're not double dipping because this means less, uh, less volume, right, when we're going after that attrition. So we adjusted all these other numbers to match. So with essentially three rules in place, and with a uh, uh, with with people knowing that they can uh, that you can see what they're printing, you can look this customer in the eye and say, "We're going to be able to save you sixteen hundred bucks a month. That's twenty thousand dollars a year." Right now, do you have to give them all of those savings? No, these are just numbers. It's data again, right? It's it's about how do you leverage this? 
do you want to be able to give them all of that savings? No, this is, this is where you have the flexibility to say, well, we're going to be able to uh, put in three, four devices that are better to replace those, and we're going to save you a thousand bucks a month, and you guys will still be ahead. Now, as you'll see below here, there is an environmental impact to this, right? Because when we're talking about duplex savings and attrition savings, we're talking about them using less paper. Now, uh, so we can quantify that because the, uh, the excuse me, uh, these pop-ups are driving me crazy. <laughs> so uh, we can quantify that, right? Because by putting in those rules, we are going to be able to save them 14,400 sheets of paper a month by doing that, right? That's 158 pounds of paper. Now, the EPA tells us that the average tree that they cut down for pulp production will yield around about uh, 8,300 sheets of paper, okay? So we can quantify that into trees. So we can say, look, we're going to be able to save you 21 trees this next year. Now, some companies even have um, uh, environmental targets, right, for their CO2 offset, right? Again, we can, uh, uh, the, those same trees will eat around about 45 pounds of CO2 in a year, so we can give them what their CO2 offset is. Most times when they're looking for that kind of a, uh, a payoff or measurement of their t CO2 offset, what they're looking at is their manufacturing. They're not looking necessarily in their office. This is a way that you can start to uh, um, talk to them in different ways. Um, and uh, just for an equivalent standpoint, you know, um, that's, uh, well, that's 3,800 miles, uh, but the one that always uh, uh, strikes me is uh, how many, uh, I don't know if you guys grill with a, uh, a propane tanks, but if you do, uh, you, can, uh, you can flip a lot of burgers with 78 propane tanks. So that's how we go about helping our premium members to approach their customers, their existing customers, get a larger share of their wallet. Uh, and that's really what it's all about. This is just as effective, however, when you're going after net new because your competitors are not taking care of, your, of those customers that they have in this way, right? The vast majority of them are just looking at their DCA information and going, yeah, things seem fine, maybe you want to do this, maybe you want to do that. No, what you're coming in to say is, look, we know you've been with so and so down the hall, down the road there for years, and uh, you know they're a good company and all, but can they do this? And the first question that's going to be asked of them by that customer is saying, "How come you never show me this?" And guess what? If you can get your, if you can start collecting the information in there, that is uh, going a long way to excluding them. Because if they come back in and say, "Yeah, we, we'll, we'll give you that too," and you say, "Well, no, we, we've already got it now." So it's a very sticky way of exploiting information. So with that, um, Paul, can, I'm just going to pass uh, back the uh, present, presenter role to you. Um, and we're going to just uh, go to our last slide there. Now you're um, asking me if I've actually got it up and running here. Hold on a second. <laughs> Um, so while I get this last page up and running, um, please, uh, guys, there is a, uh, a chat window there that you can start asking questions on, um, and that should uh, give you guys a good indication if you have any questions, if you have any comments on this. Um, ultimately, what we do here is we do a couple of different ways. First off, we look at flipping and replacing devices, so we target those poorly reporting devices or those older devices or the ones that have higher volumes. When doing that, we're increasing your wallet size. We're also uh, giving you guys the ability to offer things like software to enhance your offering. Under the premier program that we currently have, there's no extra line item that you need to sell your customer a very large and expensive piece of software. It gets included into your offering. It becomes that part of this is what we do as an organization and it increases your wallet share. Not only that, but it also shows the ROI. As you can see from what James just demonstrated, the ROI on a lot of this, and including into the premier offering, including the way that we do business, is almost instantaneously. It's not, hey, you need 12 months to do this. It is, 
this is going to happen the very first month we implement everything. And it sets you up for the future because not only are you looking at a way and a process of targeting these customers, identifying areas of opportunity and, and striking out with this type of uh, this type of proposal, but it allows you to build an additional line of recurring revenue beyond just collecting the click charges. And then further to that, um, when we're talking about setting up for the future, that's the conquer part of what we're uh, of this presentation, right? And that really, I mean, when you when you think of the word conquer, um, you know. It, conquering is not an immediate thing. It's a it's something that's done over time, right? Battles are won quickly, uh, right? And in isolation. But to conquer, you need ongoing uh, efforts, and that's where your quarterly business reviews are hugely increased by having this kind of information flowing to you uh, from your customers. Because when you're every one of you with your salespeople. You want them going back into your customers and growing that share of the wallet, right? Your, your salespeople, however, they're like, every time they're going back in, well, I'll bring donuts, I'll, uh, uh, I'll do this, I'll do that, uh, and uh, I think I'll just say hello, right? That's quite often <laughs> what is the, the limit of it, right? Or the, you got that bit of DCA information. Well, if you've got this kind of information flowing in there, you're, you're uh, your reps have many, many reasons to go back in there and say, where were we? What have we done? Where are we now? What more can we do in the future? So it really is a target strike and over time conquer those prospects. So uh, let's throw this open for questions if there are any and uh, we will go from there. Let's see, do we have any? So, um, a first question I have is, um, um, what are the, uh, you know, uh, sorry, it's saying, if I offer this out to every single one of my customers, uh, we are, um, we might run out of licensing, we might run into issues with, with getting saturated out there. What is the license limitation of the Premier Program? Um, okay, well, the, the license limitation on the program is uh, absolutely unlimited. There are no limitations whatsoever. So when you become a premium member, uh, it is um, an all-you-can-eat buffet. You pay one prim uh, premier monthly fee, and from there, everything is uh, included as much as you want. i got another question here. Um, the MPS rating system, um, is that available to uh, everyone? Uh, Actually, everything that we've shown you today is available only to our premier members. It is a uh, it is an exclusive club. Um, um, that isn't so. The MPS certification isn't uh, available uh, widely. However, we do have a website uh, that will uh, allow you to uh, get a little bit more information on that. Um, another question here um, we have is uh, sorry are there um, are there any um, other additional um, offerings outside of the rules based printing that are included into the premier program um, yeah we uh, so included in the premier premier program is our IDM which is our um, device monitoring software. Um, there is also the Print Audit 6 program, which is the uh, rules-based printing, uh, the analysis software, and also the ability uh, to uh, do chargeback. Uh, you know, lawyers, architects, engineers, they all charge back for the printing that they're doing. Um, and uh, so that can be, uh, that is included. Uh, it's also, uh, we have our embedded tools. So uh, we are embedded on the majority of the uh, manufacturer's panels. Um, uh, there, I, it's easier to point out the gap, and the gap is Canon. Uh, if there's any Canon dealers out there, you probably know how, uh, how uh, friendly they are <laughs> to uh, third-party softwares. Um, and also in there is our secure release and follow me print. Um, you also gain access to the Insight Intelligence Dashboard, which uh, Paul was demoing for you. Um, but uh, I think the one of the uh, one of the key things to the program, it's it's all very well having a suite of tools, but um, 
the expertise to be able to pull the intelligence out of there is not so common, right? It's, uh, I mean, you, you guys examine your own companies and say, and think to yourselves, okay, do I have people to make this work? Um, we bring that expertise to the table for you so that you are essentially putting a well-oiled machine in place rather than just a tool set. So that appears to be all the questions uh, for today, James. Excellent. Well, um, thank you all very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, we are available to answer any additional questions that you have, or if you want to uh, go into some more detail on any of these, uh, any of these tools that we've shown you or any of these uh, strategies, I'm happy to set something up. But uh, thank you, Paul, for uh, showing us, and thank you all for your time today. Appreciate it.